Uh, today I'm here with Brian Hardy. Brian Hardy is uh, one of my Patreon members uh, who volunteered to set up time to chat um, about nutrition and recovery and those sort of things. But uh, Brian, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. Thank you and happy to be here. Um, and yeah, I am um, someone who's very interested in uh, the, the intersecting worlds of sort of, you know, posture and pain and uh, chronic tension and digestive issues and uh, recovery and, you know, not just recovery from, say, a workout, but recovery from surgery or injury. Um, and the reason why is because going through a lot of that stuff myself, uh, when I didn't have any insight or any understanding of how to take care of this body uh, and how to help it to regenerate uh, really like initiated me into um, this line of work um, and having this be such a, a driving force in what I'm interested in and, you know, how I serve and what I'm passionate about. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot to chat about and uh, a lot to share with folks who may be struggling, who may be feel, feeling stuck or feeling like, you know, they've just become... Um, they've normalized their pain, right? They've mm -hmm. just kind of accepted that this is the way it is and there might not be that much I can do for it. Um, and hopefully by the time we finish our conversation, they have some very practical, tangible things that they can start doing uh, to move the needle on that, so. Well, sounds good. Well, I know for me, um, go going into personal training and rehab and all that, it was from my own personal experience with chronic pain and injury, poor posture, um, uh, and so I believe that's the case for you as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, your personal journey, uh, struggling um, with chronic health issues? Yeah, yeah. So um, I wasn't into health growing up, really. You know, I like to like do a little bit of training and calisthenics and pretend I was like a superhero, but really had no uh, basis for a solid foundation of health uh, until I was 18 years old. And just a number of factors, you know, I recognized far later that I had been pretty much constipated my whole life and didn't realize that was a thing. You yeah. know, I thought it was normal to strain and to not have regular bowel movements, um, which seems to be the case for a lot of folks, right? So it's, it's definitely mm -hmm. not, not normal. It's very common, but it's not normal. Um, but that was my, you know, first 18 years of my life. And um, at that point, my system just became too burdened from a number of things that could have been the, the stress of university. I was in my first year of university. Um, the stress of, I was trying to put on a bunch of muscle. So I was training a bunch and just eating like an idiot. Um, and all those things came together to uh, essentially trigger appendicitis. Mm. And uh, it, it went misdiagnosed. I didn't know what it was for like the first four days. I just felt very, very sick and uh, weak and like this weird kind of gnawing feeling in my gut but it wasn't localized at all to like the, you know, the lower quadrant as they say. Um, so I just kind of like, you know, tried to sleep it off and drink Powerade and like hope that it would go away. Yeah. And it didn't go away. It got far, far worse to the point where I ended up in the ER and uh, then was promptly misdiagnosed by that doctor. Um, and I think that was probably the time it was rupturing because the pain that I felt waiting in that ER was so intense that I felt like I could understand the uh, thinking towards like suicide or wanting to end suffering for the first time in my life, which was really an interesting awareness to have um, at 3 a.m. lying down on a hospital in a waiting room <laughs> bench. And so they loaded me full of painkillers, two shots of morphine, a prescription for Tylenol threes, did an <laughs> x-ray uh, and poked my stomach a few times and then said, you have the flu, go sleep it off. Ooh. And I was just like, at this point, I haven't eat, I haven't eaten in four days. I've been living on Gatorade and Powerade. Um, and I just went through like the most painful experience of my life. And clearly something's not right. But he totally missed it. So long story short, my mom comes down, pick me up from school, we go to a different hospital, they do a CT scan, uh, see that I'm a mess. That was the technical term that they used and did surgery and <laughs> yeah. saved my life, thank God. Um, but what, wow. that, what that did was it left me with a very large scar that took a long time to heal uh, because of the infection mm. and all the antibiotics 
and all of the scar tissue set me up for what became my real sort of turning point. Um, because after that whole ordeal, I tried to go back to living normally, <clears throat> right? Back yeah. to university, trying to just get through my classes, trying to just enjoy myself, eat the foods I like to eat, drink on the weekends, all that kind of stuff. And my system was not responding well to it. Um, so it took about a year of attempting to pretend like it wasn't something bigger going on uh, to where things really broke down and ended up having essentially a, a yeast overgrowth, candida overgrowth, uh, paired with scar tissue adhesions call it, causing bowel obstructions. Um, wow. So all of that came together. And pretty much since that moment, in that period, health has been the driving force in my life, in my work, in my, my studies. Um, and it took a number of years to sort of work my way out of that situation. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I just became obsessed with reading and trying different things and trying to piece together how can I reverse uh, what's been done to the greatest extent and prevent this from happening again. Um, so yeah, that was, that was really why I you know, do what I do today and have this, uh, this deep passion for this area. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit um, about what that journey was like for you. Like what worked, what didn't work for you? Um, what kind of professionals were you seeking out? What did you try? Because uh, I've heard similar stories um, many, many times over the years in my practice uh, with individuals who just like not getting answers, um, struggling with all kinds of chronic health stuff, uh, misdiagnosis or, you know, so many secondary effects uh, after like, you know, such a, an operation. Yeah. So, I mean, what really started to move things, and I'll talk more uh, towards the scar tissue at this point, um, because the dietary stuff, um, you know, candida overgrowth is a very common thing, you know, dysbiosis, imbalance, gut bacteria, and yeast balance. It's a very common thing. Um, and that can be reversed if you do it correctly, in my experience, in about 12 weeks. Um, and I have entire interviews online that uh, if people are interested, they can reach out or they can look me up um, and find discussing the, the depth, the details of that side of things. Um, but for the scar tissue and the adhesions and the bowel obstructions and the chronic pain side, um, what I really found was, and I mean, because if you are admitted to the hospital with a bowel obstruction, um, they basically put you on liquids and then hope that it passes. And if it doesn't pass, then they do surgery to remove those adhesions, which has to cause further adhesions, Yeah. right? So it becomes this really vicious cycle. Luckily, when I went to the hospital uh, for bowel obstructions, uh, it passed and cleared. And then as soon as I got home, I was just researching natural ways to prevent and reverse and treat bowel obstructions. And I found this clinic in the States called Clear Passage, uh, which is a it was founded by a husband wife team and she had had a scarring um, around her uterus and her fallopian tubes and was infertile and in chronic pain because of it. And uh, they were both physical therapists by training. And so they got really, really deep into uh, physical therapy, massage, osteopathy, studied with some really, really top level people and developed a system to manually break down those adhesions. Um, and allow her to get out of pain and actually be fertile again. Um, then they just applied that same model to the intestines, right? So they figure if we can open up scarred fallopian tubes, which are tiny, certainly we can open up the intestines, which are yeah. a lot bigger by comparison. And they've been doing that for probably 20 plus years now, I think. Um, and so I was blessed enough to have parents that would support me in going down to their clinic and getting 20 hours of deep tissue <laughs> massage in five days on my wow. guts. And wow. that was a, <laughs> it sounds intense. It was, it was intense and it was amazing. It was so empowering and eye opening. Um, cause they, the whole time that they're working most of the time, uh, they're educating you, right. And they're teaching you about your own fascia system and how it's wrapped together and how to open it up and how to loosen things up and how to use posture to affect that. And, you know, really giving you all the tools you need so that you never end up back in their office. Um, mm -hmm. And it worked for me. It, it totally opened things up to the point where 
my belly could relax again and I could breathe fully. And um, I never had a full obstruction again. I've had partial obstruction since then in the times where I forget to do my maintenance massage uh, mm. and just lose track of it. Um, but every time I come back to it and, you know, essentially it's deep tissue, their whole thing that they've studied is 90 second minimum in the specific spot and then slowly tracing those lines of tension and continuing that pressure. Um, so that after the course of, you know, five minutes or an hour, you have followed the fascia wherever it's sort of leading you and helped it to unwind. Um, so that definitely was the primary thing. Now, um, along with that, some of the sort of nutritional and lifestyle things that I found really good for stacking. Uh, one was castor oil packs. So a warm compress hot water bottle or heating pad with castor oil and a natural piece of cotton or flannel. And that just brings so much circulation to the area and so much uh, perfusion of blood and softening of this, the, the tissues um, to where if you're constipated or if you have cramps like menstrual cramps or if you have you know chronic back pain um, and I would get it to the point where the, the, the tension in the front would radiate into like my kidneys um, and just put you in a very, very uncomfortable place. And so the heat and the castor oil is a phenomenal tool. Um, and then one other thing was systemic enzymes, which are really mm -hmm. cool in that you take these enzymes away from food. So they're not digestive enzymes, uh, but you take them away from food. They get into your circulation and then act like little Pac-Man going around mm. gobbling up the extra fibrous tissue. Um, and there's been people who have treated cancer successfully with enzyme therapy, uh, literally digesting tumors with enzymes and other things, They're not just taking enzymes. It's a very, you know, you gotta have a, a comprehensive approach for anything that's like potentially life-threatening. Um, but those enzymes allowed me to break down the excess tissue from the inside and to direct their flow to the area that I wanted by increasing circulation. Um, so that is, and it's something that I still, you know, when I suggest it to people or when I hear someone coming out of a surgery, um, it's still very uncommon for them to be aware that systemic enzymes can be such a powerful tool. Um, so those would be sort of like the top three things, uh, massage, castor oil packs, and systemic enzymes. We're starting to address some of that chronic uh, scarring and, and, and tension and pain. And how about uh, inflammation? Because I know that's something that a lot of people are struggling with, like chronic inflammation, um, whether it's systemic or localized um, to the gut. And, uh, you know, the thing with uh, taking anti-inflammatories is that, you know, it blocks prostaglandin 1, but also prostaglandin 2. And so one of them, you know, is responsible for the inflammatory response, but the other one is actually responsible for healing. So if you overdo it with pharmaceutical anti-inflammatories, you're actually starting to put a halt on the inflammatory and healing process altogether. Um, so yeah, just in general, uh, for individuals suffering from, like, say, chronic fascial inflammation, uh, chronic digestive inflammation. Is there anything that you found uh, to be particularly helpful on that front? Yeah, well, one thing, and this is um, definitely a universal, is uh, magnesium. Um, and just having adequate magnesium in the body, because magnesium is really like the relaxation mineral, and it facilitates the functioning of so many enzymes and so many processes in the body, if that's not there, it's going to be a lot harder to heal and a lot harder to get your nervous system into the rest and digest and regenerate side of things, right? Because healing is very unlikely to happen, at least in a complete and efficient manner, if we're constantly triggered into sympathetic dominance, if we're constantly on the run, if we constantly are in anxious moods or anxious states, uh, we're not sleeping well, right? We're not, we're not turning off, we're not down regulating. Um, so magnesium for me is 100% always has to be on board. Um, that could be transdermally, right? So you can topically apply it to the specific area where the most tension is being held. Um, you could soak in a bath with magnesium salts and you can also take it internally. I like all of those formats um, and I suggest them all depending on the, the, the individual and sort of their context. Um, you know, there are several um... <clears throat> 
versions of uh, magnesium that you can ingest. And I know that some are more bioavailable than others. Uh, could you touch upon that briefly? Yeah. So uh, there's, yeah, there's a lot of forms and this is true of like any mineral, right? So magnesium, potassium, uh, even things like vitamin C, they're bound to different things and thus they have different effects in the body. And so um, some of the research, I first came across it from Charles Poliquin, um, mm. who was such a, you know, encyclopedia of so many amazing things. Um, and uh, he was basically laying out how different forms of magnesium have different affinities for tissue. So like one form uh, might go more to the brain. One form might be better for relieving the bowels if you're constipated. Another form might be more for muscular support. Another form, magnesium taurate, as in taurine, the amino acid, uh, seems to support the heart better than other forms. Um, so it's important to have ideally a, a broad spectrum of sources. Um, I work with a product now that I really like because it has seven forms uh, and they're all bioavailable forms. Um, so that makes it simple. But for the longest time, I would just bounce between anything with an A-T-E ending. So okay. magnesium citrate, right? Or magnesium malate or glycinate uh, or L-threonate or taurate. Um, anything with, or, or chelate, like anything with an A-T-E ending is going to be decent. Um, whereas the malate and the taurate and the bisglycinate and the glycinate, those tend to be the best absorbed. Um, and it's going to be, you know, very slightly different depending on the individual with what form might be best, but any form is better than no form. Um, uh, another, a fun one, which you can't really buy as a supplement, but if you are into do it yourself kind of stuff at home and you want the least expensive form of magnesium and arguably one of the best, uh, that's magnesium bicarbonate. And you can actually make this yourself by taking distilled water, getting it really cold, um, uh, carbonating it with like a home soda stream uh, or buying carbonated water and mixing magnesium hydroxide into the carbonated water. Uh, that creates a reaction which creates the magnesium bicarbonate, um, which is a very bioavailable form seems to be associated with longevity in specific areas of the world where the, the spring water and the groundwater and the, the healing springs is very high in that form of magnesium. Um, and that can cost like pennies. You know, if you just have your own soda stream, you fizz up the water and you're putting the magnesium hydroxide in. Um, so that's another cool form. If people are into that sort of, yeah. you know, more biohacker esque do it yourself type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any other, um, like maybe let's talk about biohacking a little bit, anything outside of the nutritional realm uh, in regards to treating chronic inflammation, um, chronic illness, anything that maybe uh, isn't on uh, most people's radars? Yeah. Well, and one thing in which you have in the back there, uh, the infrared sauna, right? Mm. So infrared radiation, far, near, uh, far seems to be the most effective for certain things. Um, I like to combine infrared with red light. Yeah. Um, and there's yeah. the specific forms of red light that you can find. You can buy all kinds of devices these days um, that just send out a high intensity red light. And it's amazing how effective that can be to not only speed healing, but to reduce pain um, and also stimulate collagen growth, which is cool for those of us that want to have, you know, a nice complexion uh, or if we have scars of some sort we want to work on. Um, so red light um, would probably be the other, like if I could only pick one or two things, that would probably be up there um, because it's something you can have at home. It's something which is uh, relatively affordable for what you're getting, like the bang for your buck. Um, yeah. And it, it should last you a lifetime. Um, yeah. So that's, that's another fantastic, fantastic thing you can use that's not nutritional, that doesn't require you to do anything except sit in front of it. Um, and absorb the benefits passively. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of red light therapy <clears throat> as well as low level laser therapy. Um, mm. I've got a little laser for any kind of like joint inflammation, that sort of thing, but I've got the platinum led coming in, uh, which is, uh, both far and near. And there's also a new product called uh, flex beam, 
which Ooh. is an Indiegogo campaign right now. And it's actually half the price of the Platinum LED. The Platinum LEDs will run about $1,000. But Flexbeam has very similar stats on the wavelengths. And mm. you can get it for $500. And what's cool about it is actually you can wrap it around different joints and stuff. So you can wrap it around like a belt or on your shoulder. Or you can just lay it on the table to shine on your face. Um, but yeah, red light therapy, great for like facial rejuvenation, for reducing inflammation in the fascia and the joints. Um, also certain wavelengths have been shown to help with traumatic brain injury, <clears throat> concussion recovery. Uh, I've got a friend who was shining down his teeth uh, to heal a cavity and it worked. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. So really red light. Line. That was red or laser? Uh, red light. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm, I'm certainly leaning more towards red light than low level laser therapy. I mean, they're, they're both quite expensive. Like you can get like the B cure laser, for like $1,400, but the problem is it only gets a very small area and it's mm. a faster treatment. It's like a six to seven minute treatment while the red light therapy you're looking at like 20 minutes. Um, but you just cover such a broader area with the red light therapy and there's so many different uses for it. So especially if you can get a combination unit like the platinum LED where you can kind of get all the different frequencies to get all the benefits. Um, yeah, cool, cool. Good stuff. Very cool. All right, so we've got some questions here. Let me just review that. Um, yeah, we want to talk about some misconceptions about gut health. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing, um, you know, and it's important to remind ourselves that everything pretty much starts in the gut. Like if we're not digesting food properly, it's going to be very hard to create energy, to heal, to recover, to have an immune system of any sort, um, uh, and to basically just feel like ourselves. Um, and it's interesting because these days, so many of us are brought up where pretty much from the get go, our gut was compromised, right? So whether that's, we never were breastfed, um, or whether that's our mother was not doing so well when we were in, you know, when she was birthing us and when she was pregnant with us. And so, you know, it is what it is, but a lot of people are born at a significant disadvantage because of those factors. Mm. Um, and so, uh, just recognizing that, you know, uh, a single probiotic is not necessarily going to save your life or be the answer to all your problems. Um, I see people who struggle with like long-term IBS and IBD, and they're trying different things. And most of the time, unfortunately, they're trying the very cheap probiotics that are available in like a shopper's drug mart, like your average, you know, uh, pharmacy, not even a health food store. And so the quality usually isn't there. Um, and most probiotics don't actually survive and get into the deeper parts of the colon where we typically want them to do their fermentation and to do their, you know, they create B vitamins for us. They create short chain fatty acids for us. They do all kinds of great things that keep us healthy, keep us feeling good. Um, but it seems like, you know, there's all this talk about the microbiome and it certainly has a huge impact. And we still don't really know what's going on. It's still so complex with the interplay between bacteria, viruses, funguses, um, and obviously the different foods that we're eating, right? It's a very, very yeah. complex thing. Um, but one thing I can say is that it seems like either, you know, wild fermented things from your local environment, those can be really beneficial um, because Assuming you're not in a completely toxic environment, uh, you're taking the cultures and the yeast that are naturally occurring in the, in the air, or if you're wild foraging for things, you're getting the stuff out from in nature. Um, and those things can be really good because uh, it just brings diversity, right? We want diversity in our microbiome, uh, whether we're breathing that in, like we're breathing in the dirt in the garden in the springtime, uh, or we're getting it on our skin, under our nails. We're eating some of the dirt because our, you know, we're, we're plucking fresh greens from the garden or whatever it is. All those things encourage diversity. Um, and if you have a gut infection, which a lot of people do and they don't recognize, it could be bacterial, parasitic. Uh, parasites are quite a big one that gets overlooked. Um, if you have an infection going on, then until you address the infection, anything you do is like throwing a little bit of water on a fire. It's not yeah. going to get the fire extinguished at the root. Um, and so you're likely to experience ongoing inflammation, ongoing digestive issues, uh, 
just weird symptoms that don't really make sense and that your regular doctor probably can't, you know, put together that this might be a, a stealth infection, as we call them. Um, but it's really important to, to be aware that those are really a thing. You know, parasites are a thing. Uh, they're not necessarily bad, all of them either. Um, no. But that if we don't address that, and I mean, one easy way to do, if you have some kind of ongoing mystery, you know, symptoms, uh, is to do like a yearly or every other year parasite cleanse. Uh, you can mm. take different formulas and, you know, knock down the population of those potentially harmful uh, organisms. Um, yeah. And if you notice your, your symptoms improve dramatically while doing something like that, then you're, you're onto something there, right? You have, you have some good data indicating that there was likely a population of, you know, uh, foreign, foreign guys that are, kind of taking up <laughs> residence in a place that we don't want. Yeah. Um, I've certainly had my own experience with that. Um, and it's wild with, uh, with parasites and also with like candida overgrowth, that sort of thing where it, you just adapt to it and you get used to it. And then you don't realize that there's actually a problem in the first place until you are actually on the other side of it. Um, I think parasites is one of those things where there's a lot of people who have parasite overgrowth and uh, like absolutely no idea and not even aware of just how much it's draining uh, their energy levels. Yeah. Um, can we speak a little bit about uh, leaky gut? And that's also something that seems to, you know, I think most people have like a leaky gut to some extent. Uh, a lot of folks are just not aware of what it is at all, um, you know, and how it can really impact everything going on with your digestive system and uh, chronic health issues related to, uh, to the gut. Yeah. And so, I mean, to break it down real simple, we're just talking about, um, uh, essentially, you know, intestinal inflammation um, and the slight widening, we're talking on a, on a microscopic level, right? So the slight widening of the otherwise, uh, you know, more uh, tight little gaps that allow for nutrients to be absorbed. Um, and I'm with you, I think it's pretty much an epidemic um, that most people have it to some degree. And um, I guess the things to uh, really be aware are that there can be multiple causes, right? So parasites can be a cause. Uh, even certain forms of radiation seem to be a cause, whether you live or work in like a Wi-Fi hellhole and you're just mm. bombarded all the time with non-native signals, that can seem to throw off that sort of system. Um, yeah, and it's, it's a whole like leaky gut, leaky brain connection, yeah. right? Um, so it's just... These, these things in the environment that can compromise the integrity of our systems. Um, obviously, certain foods, if you can't digest them uh, or they're not properly cooked or prepared, can contribute to something like this. And it's interesting with this whole, you know, gluten-free, dairy-free movement. And I was, you know, I practiced that for many years in my healing. I think it was an essential piece of the healing. And I don't think it's necessarily the gluten and the dairy, uh, particularly gluten and gluten containing grains. I don't think it's particularly the gluten that's necessarily causing so many people these issues. Um, it's the glyphosate, which is the pesticide yeah. that's sprayed on all this stuff and yeah. which we know is in our rainwater, right? It's yeah. pretty much everywhere. It's been sprayed so much. Um, so even if we're eating, you know, quote unquote, organic produce, that doesn't mean it's 100% safe, yeah. right? Which is something I don't think people uh, think about. They think, oh, organic, that means healthy and safe. Um, yeah. And certainly healthier and safer, but not necessarily 100% clean. Um, yeah. So exposure to those things, even in tiny, tiny amounts, uh, we know disrupts that gut lining and that gut barrier and that intestinal integrity. Um, so it's something to be aware of. Um, it's something to want to bring in some of the more soothing and rebuilding substances. This can be like an L-glutamine. This can be aloe vera gel, uh, marshmallow root, uh, slippery elm root. Um, I know you and I also talked recently about peptides, yeah. right? Something like BPC-157. Yeah, that, yeah. um, that can be really, really in, uh, like effective for healing up those gaps. Uh, and sealing up that damage. 
Um, so it's just one of those things. It's an ongoing thing, right? We're never going to escape these things. Um, they're always going to be in the environment and yet they don't have to drain us in the way that they might be up until now. Um, just takes a little bit more awareness and building in some of these mitigation strategies uh, to make sure that the gut is staying uh, less permeable and uh, more protected. Yeah, I certainly think uh, looking at gut health, it's a matter of managing inflammation. Uh, a lot of us have arthritis. <clears throat> I mean, and you can start getting it at, at, you know, 21, 22 years old. You don't need to be old to have arthritis. Mm -hmm. I certainly have a lot of it just from the nature of my lifestyle. And that's something that I'm always mindful of. I know that if I'm not doing particularly well with my self-care, I start to feel it in my joints. And so I'm always kind of consciously aware of it. And I think a lot of people are, you know, but I believe a lot of people aren't tuned in that way when it comes to their gut health. And I think overall, it's a matter of like figuring out what is causing inflammation, what is not causing inflammation, um, you know, just from your day-to-day -day diet, but also things like stress levels, like you're talking about magnesium and sympathetic versus parasympathetic. These are all factors. So um, I know with like the, the Czech um, holistic lifestyle coaching, the Paul Czech course, you know, that's one of the big things like monitoring uh, your bowel movements and your gut and knowing what's healthy and what's not healthy and what might suggest parasites, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the gluten front, yeah, definitely that blew up in a way that I think was, you know, turned into a really big diet fad. Um, and it was interesting when I started hearing about people like going to Italy for vacation and they're eating all this pasta and they're eating all this bread and they're not having any issues there because in the Italian culture there, they're so mindful of, of the quality of the grain, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that was a big tip off to the glyphosate issue. And another thing is um, uh, washing fruits and vegetables. To, you know, you mentioned about organic foods and how there still might be a lot of pesticides, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm actually a big fan of using a, um, a very diluted hydrogen peroxide, like food grade hydrogen mm. peroxide spray to cleaning fruits and vegetables, you know, cause we get fruits and vegetables from the grocery store and with, you just run them underwater a little bit, but that's not really going to do anything, you know, especially because mm. a lot of these products are kind of waxy, but um, you know, so that, that's a tip that I recommend is to make sure it's food grade. You can't get hydrogen peroxide from the pharmacy and use it. You want to get food grade hydrogen peroxide um, that's very well diluted. And then you use that to spray your fruits and vegetables and just a very simple thing to do to really help to eliminate some of these toxins there. Um, on the peptide front, yeah, I just finished a 20-day trial of uh, BPC-157, uh, GHK, and TB-500, or also known as uh, thymosin beta-4, uh, mostly to treat a shoulder injury. Um, I had a little bit of a labral tear from circus, and I'm trying to avoid surgery, and it really, it, <laughs> it really did wonders. At, at some point, I had to up the dose a little bit more to really get it effective. There's like a lot of dosing protocols, and I think it's one of those things where if you don't have the right dose, you're not going to get the benefit you're looking for. All of that being said, uh, BPC-157 is really like incredible stuff. Um, lots of studies suggest that it's very safe. Um, it, you can get it by prescription in the United States. Uh, not quite here yet, but the first thing I noticed was my gut health and brain fog. It was like within days, it was like my digestion had improved like very considerably. Same thing with the like cognition. Uh, I used to trip over my words a lot. I was like speaking a lot more clearly. I was able to focus for a longer period of time. Um, and yeah, a lot of, yeah, a lot of benefits like that. Uh, and so BPC-157 is actually a healing peptide released uh, by the stomach. Uh, and so originally it was just being used to treat these kind of digestive disorders, but then studies were starting to suggest that it could also be used to treat musculoskeletal injuries for uh, neurogenesis, all kinds of other things. It's a really nice general healing peptide um so yeah i think that's something that is certainly worth looking into if you're struggling with uh, chronic gut health and chronic inflammation that sort of thing yeah do you have any experience with that yourself yeah i had used it for a knee injury uh, i mm -hmm. tore the meniscus in my right knee a few years back and uh i did uh, two rounds of BP-157, uh, just in small injections, I think half a milligram twice a day. And the second round, I also included the TB-500. Um, and similarly, I noticed, whereas before, if I would have gone like dancing or even for like a very short, uh, relatively low intensity jog or like walk jog, um, 
I would have felt soreness for probably a few days in that knee. And it kept me from really getting into, uh, you know, my physical practices and being able to play sports and do fun things again. And within, it was almost like every single time I used it, like if I used it and then trained a little bit, the next day be very, very, very tiny amounts of residual pain or stiffness. Um, and so, yeah, I think it definitely helped expedite the healing process. Now I was doing red light and I was doing some physio exercises, um, but it was, it felt like it moved the needle more than most anything else. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's incredible stuff. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how that goes and how much it's actually integrated into, into medicine here. Alrighty. Let's go back to some of these uh, questions we came up with here. Um, but we're coming towards the end, I believe. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there anything else that you'd like to touch upon? I think we hit most of the topics you'd like to discuss about. Does anything come to mind for you? Yeah, I think one other thing to go back to talking about anti-inflammatories and, you know, more natural ways to do that and more ways that are gut friendly um, to do that is really looking at our herbs and spices, right? Mm, so what are we incorporating in our food on a daily basis that is um, by its own nature delicious and healing, right? That's like yeah. my sweet spot is how can I make food really tasty and really nutritious and really beneficial? Um, so it doesn't feel like some bland health food, but it feels like, oh my God, I get to eat this as part of like my healing prescription. This is yeah. wild. So things like, you know, ginger, turmeric root, uh, rosemary, basil, oregano, thyme, pretty much any herb and spice, ideally organic or homegrown whenever you can. Um, cinnamon, cardamom, like the list goes on and on and on for these really tasty and really effective uh, herbal medicines is really what they are, yeah. right? Um, and that's the kind of thing that, you know, back in the day, if we were getting sick, that's what grandma would cook up. You know, she'd make soup, she'd make tea, she'd make whatever. Um, and that would be the medicine. That's like the old folk medicine. Yeah. And a lot of those wild plants still are unmatched in their efficacy and their safety. Things like wild, truly wild oregano oil are, will basically kill anything, um, bacterial, viral, like anything. These things are very, very potent. And they're not going to overload the system the same way that pharmaceuticals would, right? They're not going to cause the, the, uh, the strain on the liver in quite the same way. You can still overdo it, right? You can still overdo yeah. it with these things. Um, so making, making sure you're not overdosing um, with natural or pharmaceutical is important. But whether it's, you know, in a smoothie in the morning, like this morning, I think I dropped a couple of cardamom pods and a, a shizandra berry into my smoothie just because um, yeah. I'll often put a chunk of ginger in there um, uh, or whether you're making soup, like where we are, it's winter time, great time for warming soups and stews and doing like crock pot, slow cooker type of things and just loading it up with herbs and spices, making a curry, like all of that stuff is medicine and is beneficial. And when you have it ongoing every day as part of your regular diet, uh, it's easy to maintain. Oh, awesome. Yeah, you're uh, certainly a wealth of knowledge when it comes to supplements. And uh, one of the first people I like to reference to on that front, it's I personally find it so overwhelming. You know, I'd be a personal training for 13 years. And I just like nutrition is such a, a deep dive. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's but I, I like what you're saying about uh, variety. I think you're really onto something there about just trying to get as much variety to buffer your system and, you know, not lean into one element uh, too much, you know. I'm always very mindful to try and rotate my foods personally that I'm not eating the same thing every single day and building up a food resistance to it, but also supplements. So mm -hmm. like when I make my smoothies, I have three or different, um, I have three different meal replacements that I like to use. So every day I cycle between a different one as the mm -hmm. base of my smoothie. So I'm not taking the same product every single day. So I think there's certainly something, something to it there. Otherwise, you know, you're just kind of maxing out these levels in your body and ignoring other things. And then that's when things start to go awry. Right. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, let's start to wrap it up. Um, so how can our audience follow up with you? Um, 
you know, on the, the nutrition front, the coaching front, what do you have to offer? Let's just talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, if this has resonated or you are someone who is uh, ready to up your game on the nutrition front and just, you know, give your lifestyle a bit of an overhaul uh, because you want more energy, you want more focus, you want better digestion, you want to get out of pain, um, then we can certainly have a, uh, offer a free conversation to see if I could even help you, right? Because sometimes I can't help people. And uh, that's when I look to refer, um, find someone who might be more well suited for your situation. Um, but if you're interested, uh, you can reach out to me uh, a, a couple ways. Uh, I'm pretty active on Instagram. Uh, that's Brian Hardy seven. That's Brian with a Y Hardy seven on Instagram. Uh, also on Facebook, Brian Hardy and uh, email. You can email me at optimal health at brianhardy.ca. Uh, that'll go to my more work focused email. Um, and yeah, just, you know, get in touch. You know, I'm pretty accessible, pretty easy to talk to, uh, pretty open guy, um, and always happy to meet people where they're, where they're at and, uh, you know, book in a free call and just, you know, just see where people are at, where they want to go. Um, and if I can help them get there, then I'm happy to do so. Awesome. Well, be sure to plug in all your details in the description on this video so people can follow up. I very much encourage you to do so. Brian's a great guy and very, uh, very helpful. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, this was a lot of fun. I haven't done anything like this before, so maybe it will be um, a regular thing. So if anyone out there would like to do something like this, you have um, a healing journey you'd like to talk about, or you just like to discuss health and fitness and rehab, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Reach out. Thanks a lot. Beautiful. Thank you.